Hello everyone and welcome to Let's Talk HR. Today we're going to take on the topic of banter um, and there are many names um, for banter but people often try and use it as a get out of jail free card when they potentially offended someone or hurt somebody but there is a lot of research to say that banter in a workplace has a lot of positive benefits and has a lot of um, psychological benefits to people feeling like they, they belong in part of a workplace. So we're going to have a bit of a discussion about that today. And today I'm joined by Lee and Marie and Claire. Claire, this is your first time joining us. Have you got your song read? No, there's no song. <laughs> <laughs> See, answer, we're off. Um, how are you today? Thank you for yeah. joining us. Yeah, really good. Really, really, really excited to be here. Thank you for having me. And your, your few, is this two months into the new business now? Is it, um, it was, it's just over three months. I, I launched mm. on November the 14th, so it's just been over three months, yeah. So uh, still early days, but um, a, a roller coaster, but a, a wonderful one, a wonderful one. And um, I'm Marie, I'm assuming you have to deal with this subject all the time in a hospital, because we know how doctors sometimes speak to people so do they try and use the get out of banter free card um yeah i would say the banter free card oh i didn't mean it like that oh that's not how it was meant to land all those kinds of things come up it's not just doctors it's everybody <laughs> i just pick on doctors because i get paid the most money and Lee, <laughs> it's been a little while it's good to have you back on are you, are you doing a road trip uh, around Jardine Motors? Motors? I'm actually in my home today, um, so which is nice. Yeah, I remember where it is. I'm going off again tomorrow, yeah. though. And the motor industry, I'm guessing, you know, car sales, that, that can be a bit of a bantery type of environment for people. Do you get I it think... often in the training room or is it something that they ask you to train on? <laughs> well, they wouldn't get very training, for, very good training from me on that. Um, the uh, yeah, I think you know, salespeople are kind of renowned for uh, you know, can be, be a bit of a laugh. Um, so yeah, definitely, this uh, exists within the motor industry, um, and it's definitely a challenge. So, I'd be interested to see what we talk about here. Well, I'm going to start with what does banter mean to you? So. Before we started, I, I was very honest. I just went away on a on a stag weekend with with um, people that I used to play rugby with, and it's fair to say, compared to most other people in my life, including family, the line is, shall we say, quite pushed, and it and it's done on purpose. You know, they try to offend so that they can hold it over you for the next twenty years of your life. Um, and I'm okay with that because it, it's fair and equitable for everyone. And I think sometimes when banter is fair and equitable for everyone quite like it but at the same time if someone is offended which sometimes happens in this situation then that is the stick that they will be beaten with for the next 20 years or so so for me banter is just about team cohesion and a group of people coming together being able to sort of enjoy each other's company in a less formal and less structured manner so if i was to say that what it means to me that's probably what i come from it's like a, a team dynamic bringing people together um Lee, I'll start with you. What what does banter mean to you in that sort of straight question context? I totally agree with you in that it's important. I, I mean, what is banter? I think it's humour, it's jokes, but particularly taking the mick out of each other, for want of a, a better phrase. Um, you know, I think where where things get accused of being banter is when we yeah, we take the mick out of other people for either a certain trait or something they've said or maybe a characteristic or whatever it might be. Sometimes it can be self-deprivating as well. It doesn't always have to be about other people. But yeah, essentially it's making jokes either about or with the people in the room with you. But therein lies the danger. That's where the danger is. You kind of need consent to do that. But you, you know, humour doesn't work like that to say, oh, James, do you mind if I take the mic out of you today? Oh. Uh, you know, it doesn't work like that. So you kind of have to read the room and that's the difficulty, isn't it? Very true. And, and, and Anne-Marie, for you, if someone says, you know, what, what does banter mean from, from your perspective? It's a bit of fun. It's a bit of a joke. It's a bit of back and forth with someone which is very light-hearted very kind of in the moment it's funny it's amusing it makes everybody feel a little bit better about themselves or about a work situation or it should 
um it's the kind of thing that you know you build your team camaraderie through it it gets everybody pulling together and it's how you find you've got things in common what do people like what do they like and enjoy doing and that sort of thing yeah and claire round it out for us what what does banter mean to you um, yeah, well, just an extension of of, of, of what anne just said. For me, it, I see it as a way of often building rapport with people. Mm -hmm. um, so I obviously, I have clients in lots of different industries and banter means different things to different people. I think it's very subjective. Um, and I think everybody's got their own own lines. You know, some you can have some levels of banter with some people and, and, and some some you can't. But yeah, I think it's it's a way of having fun, getting to know the people that you're with, um, but everybody's interpretation and perception is different, which is which is probably why we're having this conversation. Yeah, and I think you know, I'll stick with you for this. You know, when I I put a post out today, sort of giving some banter examples. You know, and the first one was like, "Hey, it looks like you've got your game face on today." You know, did you have an extra cup of coffee this morning? You know, that's it's a terrible joke, but it's, it's a polite way of doing it. Whereas, you know, asking someone why they're so sensitive, why can't you take a joke is, is quite mm. deprecating. And, and I think sometimes you've got to sort of casually lean into it and see how people are in a moment. And I think you can't necessarily just go two footed in on the, on the first attempt. I think you've got to go. Mm. like yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of it is down to reading people and um, having having emotional awareness and having emotional intelligence of, of those around you. Um, and I think, um, yeah, it's if you can if you can read the room and, 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 and sort of understand your audience, then you can pitch your banter level at the right level. And as you said at the start, there's a place for it. It's, there is a, it is a positive thing. I love having banter with the people I work with. It would be really boring and dull if I didn't. But I have different banter with different people, depending on who they are. So yeah, I think it's about it's about understanding your audience and having good awareness skills and of um, reading reading who they are and, and what their boundaries are. Because banter's only banter if it's mutual. Ban well, no, sorry, banter's only only okay if it's if it's mutual and, it, and you're on the same page, really. Now, Anne-Marie, you must have a really complex job with banter because obviously hospitals can be very serious places and sometimes people are very scared. You know, we're talking patients, you know, as as well as sort of staff members. So sometimes banter is needed just to sort of make light of a dark situation or a difficult situation. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes you need humour to deal with something that's really upsetting and patients need it. How, and as a HR person in that situation, it must be a minefield. Absolutely. But I think um, feeding off on what Claire said, that's where it's even more important, really, that you pick your moments and you kind of recognise that there's a time and place for banter. And it's not going to be all the time. It's not going to be with everybody. It's going to be at certain times with certain people that you've got some awareness of and some kind of, some relationship with or some idea of what they might find appropriate and what actually might they might find really offensive. If you're dealing with somebody who's going through a really difficult time, for example, it's a patient or a family member that's really worried about um, their, their relative that you're treating, it's maybe not the time to come in all guns blazing with the humour and try and make light of the situation. So it's kind of there's a time and a place for it, I think I would say, and pick your moments. Those two key phrases fit really well with it. <laughs> and Lee, when we start, to, yeah, when we start to think about the line, this mysterious line that nobody can ever define, but everyone will tell you, don't say anything, and then you're never going to cross the line. What do you do when you cross the line? You can see you've crossed the line. And, and, it's about making an amend. It's about just backtracking quickly, isn't it? It's about making someone feel comfortable. Right, I see I've done it. Let's, as opposed to some people double down, get defensive back and it clashes. Um, what do you do when you cross the line or you can, or you think you've crossed the line with somebody? Yeah, you're right. Don't don't try and rescue it by taking the mick out of them more um, or, you know, keep talking about that particular thing you've talked about because that's just going to make it worse, isn't it? I mean, the simplest answer is apologise. Um, 
you can you've got a few options there let's say you're in a group setting you might say oh sorry james was that a bit too far um or if it's more serious than that you might want to uh, pull them aside separately and just say you know sorry if i took that a bit far there i didn't mean to offend you nine times out of ten people know when people someone's just trying to have a laugh or if they think they really don't like you that's two separate things and people people know that um so i think you know if you apologize for for something that you've done that might be a little bit too far then most people are going to accept it and then don't do it again is probably the good advice <laughs> okay it's okay to cross a line as long as you can have a sensible adult conversation to bring yourself back isn't it claire hmm yeah absolutely and i think you're absolutely right apologize and learn from it i think what what, what i've often found challenging is if um there's been banter and alliance being crossed. I haven't been part of it, but then I get brought in to address it in my role, and there isn't that understanding. And it's and you often find there's that defensive behaviour, which 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 can be quite challenging. And for me, it's about und understanding that what you mean and how it's perceived can be two very different things, and just being aware of that. So yeah, it's it's almost. If somebody doesn't feel they've done anything wrong, it can be difficult for them to apologise. So it's about apologising that they that, that they've offended somebody, even if it wasn't intentional. And and that's that's usually a way it can be resolved uh, in in the workplace. And it, you yeah, you you've done a really good point there. And I think one of the biggest things people always struggle with um, is they seek to reply, not to understand. Yes. Um, you can't Absolutely. not not always people understand why something's upset them or why it's offended them or why in that situation it's things so seek to understand is often better than just seeking to reply because you can just make the situation infinitely worse and mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you've obviously experienced when HR get called in normally that's where should we say office battle lines are drawn sometimes because mm. people go, they talk to everyone and stuff like that. And it's, mm. you're having to manage a, almost an entire department of people split on an issue than mm. necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. Two Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And by, usually by the time HR get involved, it's turned yeah. into a huge issue um, that then, you know, that you then have kind of have to backtrack and work through. But so much of this is, is often related to the culture of the organization and, and actually, you don't deal with the individuals, you deal with the culture um, of the organisation and then it becomes what's what's right for that for that company. Because, uh, as I say, different different clients, you, I, you can say some things with some clients and some things with not, you know, not with others. And it's it's just learning that and understanding that and teaching that, educating that to you to the workforce. And Marie, uh, Total Jobs did research and they found 59 percent of UK workers enjoy banter in the workplace. That's not a massive percentage. 27% of respondents felt like it can cross a line or become offensive. So you've got 25% of people feeling like it can become offensive. You've got only 60% of people that want it. Should we have it? We all seem comfortable with it, but that's quite a low number, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I'd be interested to know if the, the low number was based off individuals having experiences of banter in the workplace that maybe didn't go as intended and wasn't reflective of some of the things that we've talked about. Maybe if it was a little bit more of the offensive or the, the type that's crossed the line. Um, I like it for me, but I think, again, it depends. It depends on the work environment. It depends on the culture of the organization it depends on the teams that you're working with i think yeah i think it depends i would say let's have it but yeah. let's have it let's have it <laughs> <laughs> i'm a northerner so i'm very much kind of like you know there's not much you can say to us that offends generally we're, we're you know <laughs> let's have it but obviously everyone is different now interestingly sort of Progressing on from that lead, Perkbox did their own survey and they found 66% of UK workers enjoy banter. So maybe Total Jobs is more international and, and mm. maybe this feeds into the dry British humour, you know, 49% of that 66 feeling like it was more relaxed and comfortable working environment. So maybe that British sarcasm type approach of 
banter um, is more ingrained in us in, than other parts of the country. So maybe something you've got to be aware of if you're more of an international organisation. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, but also, banter doesn't have to be offensive. It doesn't have to be complimentary or offensive. It can be neutral. Um, an example I always give when I'm trying to live in a training session up is there's a particular programme where I then have to go through some graphs. Um, and similar to you, Anne-Marie, I'm also a northerner, so I call them graphs because that's how they should be called. <laughs> but if I... There's, there's your second piece of banter. If um, <laughs> um, I have to label them in case you don't spot them. Um, I, I, uh, if I'm doing training with people who are from the South, who mm. most of us all know will call them graphs instead of graphs, then I'll say that just to liven it up a little bit, you know, so that we're not just sitting back looking at these really dry graphs. It just makes, you know, the session a little bit more likable and it gets a little laugh out of them and their attention's still there. So, you know, banter, when we label it banter, I think it's almost like a dangerous term now because, um, you know, We've all had those HR conversations that it can cross the line, it can go too far, it can offend people, especially particularly if it's against, you know, certain characteristics, things like that. But I think when you take the label away from it and just call it making a joke, um, you know, mm -hmm. we'll just have a laugh with each other and that kind of thing, then it makes it a little bit easier. Yeah, I, I think you've highlighted the main point, though, which is when people start to use the banter card as the get out of jail free card for... <sighs> sexual comments discriminatory comments race comment you know really sort of crass not even funny no one's even laughing type of situations that's probably when it's not banter it's just abuse yeah yeah now claire one of the things um i got a response to today when i when i was asking about you know banter in the workplace which, which is just banter is just verbal ab abuse masquerading as charm which I think was quite a powerful thing for someone for someone to write. Um, I'm not necessarily sure I'm in agreement with it, but you know, 15% of UK workers say that they've experienced banter in inverted brackets that was offensive or discriminatory. So I think some people can weaponize it, mm. um, and people can use it as a get out of jail free card. But we all need to enjoy where we work, don't we? It's yeah. Sort of Absolutely. And I, I mean, I'm with Anne-Marie. I, I like banter. I would find my work really dull. I like having a joke. I'm from the North as well. You know, I like, I like, I like having you. I did I like a in there, did I? <laughs> you're, up, you're outnumbered. Um, no, for me, I would far rather there be fun and banter in the workplace than not. Absolutely all day long. Um, but yes, you know, saying, you know, derogatory comments about race, about age, about, about sex, anything like that, that isn't banter. Um, and, and I think it's on on organisations to have have, you know, good, you know, good culture, good policies to say that that isn't that isn't banter. You're crossing a line and then something's done about it. So often it, I, I've worked with a lot of clients where, well, that's just how it is. And then it becomes OK. And then that then it then that 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 then spirals. So um yeah, I think it's um I don't I am I'm I am with um I understand the need to really define what banter is and um and that in, in banter is a good thing, but there is there is a line there and that needs to be very clear in, in organizations and communicate that and it shouldn't be then used as a get out get out clause, get out guard. Now, one of the things I'm really struggling with at the moment, because I've, I've been thinking about this a little bit, which is, is people are offended by language and words and things that are put together. And yes, I, whilst I agree, certain words shouldn't be used and we should be avoiding certain phrases and sayings and th things like that. There seems to be this phraseology of phobia and things attached to things. If you say something that is potentially detrimental to something, so we're we're living in a world where world where words can be written when you're 15 years old and come back and ruin your career. You know, we've had cricketers that have been banned, we've had footballers that wrote something, and you know, we've moved away, Anne Marie, from education to just cancellation. How do we get people to understand that we can educate people? when they've said something that 
doesn't feel like it's right, as opposed to having to take really harsh, pun- you know, harsh punishments. And I agree certain words and certain phrases and certain things need very strict punishment, but there's a level of education that needs to come with this and, and, and compassion that comes with this, where if everyone gave a little bit more and realised it's not blue, red, somewhere in the middle is probably where we all live, we might actually be able to not feel as scared to say something. What, how do you sort of deal with that situation? Because everyone wants an extreme re- resolution normally when these things go bad. Yeah, and I think I, when it goes bad, you can absolutely understand the need for a, a resolution, that being extreme, because you'll have an individual in a situation where they've been offended by something and you know they want to feel like they've then had closure or had a, a return on that feeling so something's been done to put that right something's been done to stop that from happening again it won't happen and, and those kinds of things and I think I can understand why we do that and why there is a need for that but I think it does create a culture very much where sometimes people become too afraid to maybe say things won't enter into office banter or are worried about what they might say how they might say it because of how it comes across how it's perceived and actually it can lead to individuals just not saying anything, people stepping back, not not engaging in Mm. banter or camaraderie and those kinds of things. I think it's really difficult, but I would say for me, educate, keep educating, have that mutual agreement of what's acceptable and what's not. And when it goes wrong, handle it in a way that's proportionate. So in a way that looks to explain why it went wrong and why it wasn't appropriate. And maybe think about doing it differently next time or just not doing it without kind of a a really heavy slap on the wrist and reprimand as we know sometimes can happen Mm -hmm. now Lee one of the really risky times we'll call it a risky time is when you inject alcohol in the mix (laughs) Christmas parties of course he's coming (laughs) to me for this one (laughs) (laughs) Um, people in a more relaxed environment you know, people sometimes, as Anne Marie said, will really sort of try to not engage in an environment. But you get a couple of, you know, shandies down people, and and suddenly, you know, they become a lot more as they would with their family or their their close friends, and and things start to become more natural um, in terms of how you you know instead of policing yourself in work as you, some people do. How do you, you don't, because you don't want to stop that culture, but of, of people working together and enjoying socialising together. Is there, and you don't want to brief people before they go out on night out. Now you're all about to go on a night out. Someone might say something that might get a little bit close to the line. How are we going to handle that? As a t- I could just imagine you actually delivering that session. Lee. Yep, been there. <laughs> that one's on my CV. <laughs> How do we how do we do this? How do we get people more comfortable again? Because I think part of lockdown, being far away, not wanting to type banter and stuff like that, because things in writing seem to get more offensive than words. How do we get people just enjoying themselves a little bit more and, and sort of that comfortability and feeling more relaxed and stuff? How do we get people there? I think there's a bit of a, a self-awareness and a, a, um, a personal skills piece um, on this. If you know you're the kind of the person that has two glasses of wine and then just falls over like me, then I'm probably not going to have two glasses of wine um, because who knows what I might end up saying. You know, if I know that I'm someone who can easily, um, you know, really easily due to my alcohol tolerance, get drunk to the point that I'm not really responsible for my actions, then I'm probably not going to drink that much at the works party. And I think that that needs to be where what people's um, attitude on it needs to be. If you're someone who can drink like fish all night and you're going to be absolutely fine, I envy those people, um, then, you know, no problem. But this, it's that self-management, isn't it? You, you are, you've got to remember going into that situation before you take the first drink that you're responsible for yourself. At the same time, what can the company do? Well, free bar all night is not going to help your situation. 
Um, so if I'm planning a party like that, whether it's a formalized drink limit to say, you know what, here, everyone's got free drinks tokens, get yourself a, a free drink, enjoy yourself, or whether it's wine on the table just for dinner, you know, all these different things that we can do, or whether it's a more informal, you know, there'll be someone either from HR or a senior leader in the business who's there on the night, who's going to, um, you know, cut off the limit at a certain point where we think, you know, we're probably the, the room's had enough now, let's uh, say the free bar's over. Um, you know, there's certain things that we can do as the business, can't we, to, um, to try and manage that if people don't have that personal management. But, you know, I mean, we made a joke about the briefing at the start. I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily to, to make people aware. You know, we know as HR professionals that a works party falls within our jurisdiction. Um, but not everyone across the business does. Not everyone in the factories, not everyone in the, the call centres, on the shop floor, whatever business we're in. Not everybody knows that that's the situation. So a bit of a reminder that you are still a representative um, of your your business. Um, you know, you are still held, held accountable for your actions and try not to offend people. Um, please don't knock over an £80,000 wall of wine, which was the situation we had to last deal with uh, pre-COVID. Um, you know, don't cause damage to property or bring the company into dispute. Just a little reminder that, yes, have a good time, but you are still representative of the company, I think. Probably, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not a bad thing to have that little um, light-hearted briefing. <laughs> Policy documents, though, Claire. Where, where, when it when it mm -hmm. starts, when people, when the senior managers go, "Oh, we've just lost an eighty thousand, eighty grand wine wall." I want you to write a policy. I mean, I want people, you know, I want you to say this is what we expect from people. We want everyone to sign. In fact, we want a video like how everyone starts their job, showing you how to lift a box, just in case you've never seen that video before, um, <laughs> about how to behave. Yeah. Is that is that taking it too far? Um, I think, um, I mean, I it's 50-50 with the clients I work with who want uh, uh, how to hold yourself at staff do policies. And I think that they often come um, as a reaction to to not not perhaps behaving at an, off, at an office do i think look um it's it's i think there are there are they're useful i suppose if you then need to act on it right if if it's if if something's happened at an office party that that actually does constitute something that looks that you that you need to look at in terms of a conduct issue, um, but whether that could just fall under disciplinary, probably. I I think having a specific procedure it does depend on the organisation, um, but a lot of the clients I work with read that and think, well, that's not that's not the vibe I want to be giving. That's not the you know because it. But as as Lee said, light hearted light-hearted that I think that's the way to approach it um and yeah and and and, le and knowing like if, if you if there's a, if there's an office party coming up and and you've got you've got a bit of an issue with somebody you know talk about it first you know if you be aware it's that self-awareness if you're feeling a bit of something about one of your colleagues have a have a have a conversation with them first don't wait till you get that Dutch courage and do it there so it's again it's just about about that personal awareness and, and and being proactive so yeah policies i'm sitting on the fence with it really because there is a time and a place for it um and i think it again it's what it's what's the culture of the organization in my opinion i quite like a a, a preventative or a preemptive sort of email that goes out but yeah. sort of be this person don't be and then find a really good image of someone just passed out on the floor be yeah. this person, not this person. Um, can I can I interject? Is that not it. just the right place for some banter? Yeah. You know, what you've just mm -hmm. described there, it's very close to banter. Keeping it lighthearted, keeping that message lighthearted, yeah. that's the place for banter, isn't it? Make it uh, a little bit of fun instead of a really serious, let's all sit down and have a conversation about how much wine mm -hmm. you can drink and do not to push over. And then you'll get someone that replies to all. And then you get someone, <laughs> someone not reply to all, and then that whole thing goes on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, not everyone can banter, um, so I'm going to give a really good example. My nephew, my nephew's autistic, and he cannot banter for the life mm -hmm. of him. He will just turn around to you and go, "You stink." That that's his attempt at banter, um, and that's not his fault. It's just how he's how he's processes things and how he approaches things and he's tried trust me 
But any time he's tried, it is deeply offensive and probably the thing that you're most sensitive about that he will pick on because that's how he sees the world. So, Amory, how do you deal, you know, organisations now have a whole plethora of people with different sort of beliefs, understandings, structures and, and abilities in terms of being able to do this and not do this. And if people understood him, they would obviously, well, well right, we get it, not offended by it. Um, some of these bigger companies where you bring in thousands of people together, potentially like a hospital where you've probably got about like five, 6,000 people. There is a chance that people will cross paths and, and be offended, but I think hospitals get quite thick skin due to patients and different people and how they approach things. How do you sort of, you can't police people the same, can you? There's there's different levels of social awareness you expect people to have, or can you police everyone the same? I don't, no, I don't think you can. I think as an, as an organisation, you've got a responsibility to set the standard of kind of what is acceptable, what's not, um, with all the different things that you know we've got now, uh, protected characteristics. You've got equality and diversity. You've got equality and diversity policies, frameworks. You've got that kind of model of what good looks like. You can do that kind of promotion, that kind of awareness, that kind of um, this is what you should do, this is what you don't do. But I think you can only do that up to a point. You've then got to then rely on you putting that out there and being met almost halfway with the individual and with the teams and with managers in the organisation to then take it forward and actually embed it and implement it. And then that comes from them, obviously, individual social awareness, the context of the situations, the working environment, how those things translate into day-to-day -day interactions with people yeah it makes sense and i think one of the things one of the other things that i've noticed is some of the more senior people don't want to be bantered with as well there's there's that mm. there's, I, I think it's really hard and i think sometimes you've got to be led by another person but then if both people are waiting to be led nobody gets anywhere do they Mm. I'm trying. I'm trying to think about how. Yeah, I think that's where the skills in building rapport live. Um, mm. You know, as you build rapport with people that little bit more and get up that little trust triangle that we've all seen on the the PowerPoint slide before. The you know we get that little bit further and we know you know you make like a little joke maybe about yourself or about the situation. Do they laugh? Do they sort of right, okay move on or you know do they, you get some feedback from it? Worst case scenario. <laughs> um you know whether you can you can go that little bit further but again it doesn't have to be offensive banter doesn't have to be offensive it can be mm -hmm. taking the mick out of yourself it can be just talking about the situation um you know it, it doesn't have to be about someone in particular or about a negative thing about them it, banter can actually be a nice way of getting a compliment across can't it mm -hmm. it's normally spilling some food on myself which mm -hmm. happens quite regularly <laughs> Um, just because I'm in such a rush. I think, um, I, I, I was just going to say, I think banter, um, I think it's, it, it is about um, building rapport and, 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 and working out what's appropriate with the person that you, you, you're talking to. But I think as a general rule, if you, if you banter about one of the protected characteristics, it's probably going to offend somebody. Even if it's not the, the person that you're talking to, because I've, I've I've witnessed two people having a conversation hasn't offended the people having the conversation but somebody's heard it and it's offended them because of someone in their world uh so yeah I think as a general rule of thumb you know bantering about one of the protected characteristics is probably a no uh and, and probably something to be mindful of um but outside of that it is it's building trust as Lee said it's building that rapport um and I think it is very down to interpersonal skills and people with good social awareness. Uh, and it's therefore more difficult with people who are on the spectrum or who, who don't have the same abilities to to um, to read social cues. Very difficult. Very difficult. No. Can I add into that? Sorry, James. 
Go for that, it. Um, I totally agree with what you've said, Claire, but I also think it doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about the protected characteristics because mm -hmm. the more um, the more we normalise the conversation about people's characteristics or about something you don't know about, the more it it builds that trust even further and actually um, you know reduces things like people saying things that are offensive or you know. The, the more understanding we have of people that are different to us, the less yeah, we fear it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, com I completely agree. We shouldn't, that, that's not where banter lives. Um, but no. We should still talk about it. Yeah, but we shouldn't, we, we shouldn't, we shouldn't go the other way and make, make everyone terrified of talking about it. I completely agree. Yeah. Completely agree. Now, one of the really difficult parts of this is, um, so I, I, you know, I've got five nieces and nephews. One is autistic. The other four, uh, you know, might have dyslexia or something like that. And, but we we have quite a good banter level. You know, the, he, he's the youngest, so there's quite a good banter level back and forth and stuff like that. Yeah. Now there isn't, re there wasn't banter with with him for a long time, and now he took that to people not loving him the same, mm -hmm. because that's what you would think. Because you see everyone communicate. You know, you're looking at it from a facial perspective, aren't you? People communicate, two people laugh. People communicate, two people laugh. So think of it from a really systematic point of view. If you've got someone that you don't banter with and you make an active decision because obviously it's a protected characteristic and things like that, which are, it is sensible, it's really difficult because then they can feel completely excluded. Um so you have to approach that as well. And I think that's a really difficult one because obviously it's hard for them to understand banter. You know, people in wheelchairs and stuff like that, that I've got as friends, they are probably the, they say the most offensive things about themselves being in a wheelchair than nobody else would say, but they invite you in to that mm -hmm. conversation, stuff like that. So it's really hard, I think. And and I think we... we You've all raised really good points about it, but it's a really difficult balance, isn't it? Um, mm. And to sort of just take us towards the end, it's just banter is the thing that can turn a workplace toxic a lot of the times. You know, when when a, a collective of voices, you know, become mean girls or it becomes, you know, alpha male club or whatever it becomes, you know, they're the loud voice and they poke at other people and stuff like that. And that's where we've got to ensure that we avoid banter getting to, isn't it, Amory? Yeah. Good chat. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if you were going to say more there. He was like, well, we've got to avoid it getting to, and... <laughs> how, how, how do we avoid it? How do, how do we avoid that, tox, that toxic of people, that group just presiding over a group of people and... and that's it. that's not really banter anymore. It's a group of people just discriminating against everybody else in the organisation, isn't that? That's not banter at that point. That's where it's gone too far. When it's them within themselves, that's fine. The second they start to externalise it to me, that's where it's too far. Is that is that where you go? In what? How? Is, is, is that where it becomes the toxic workplace culture when people start externalising their banter to other people and, and have a protected group of people? that nobody really takes the mick out of. Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I think at that point, your group becomes very much your, I don't know if it's the mean girls or if it's your clique or it's it's whatever it is, but it becomes very much a, it's not just those individuals having the conversations, having the banter, having the back and forth that they're mutually participating in and comfortable with, they're putting it on other people that are not, potentially because they're not in the same circle they're not in that group they're not in that clique um they're in their world and it will mean something slightly different to them than what it does to the group um does that make any sense yeah yeah because i for me i think that's where it's not banter anymore mm. yeah. they might see it as banter but really they're just externalizing discrimination yeah as opposed to you know, bantering with each other. It's not inclusive then. It's, it's, it's you're pinpointing. 
Yeah. Well, to put a fine point on it, it's bullying, isn't it? Well, yeah. It's it's become bullying. Was. It's toxic. It turns a toxic workplace into a bullying workplace and makes it even more toxic where you've got to get in with the in crowd and not be yourself so that you don't get bullied. Yeah. Yeah. I think where that can really manifest as well, if you are, um, you know, if you don't fit in with the boys club or you don't fit in with the mean girls, we're, you know, we're exacerbating those examples there. They're not the only examples. Um, it's not just a case of someone who's, you know, sat on their own in the lunchroom and that sort of childhood, um, mm -hmm. you know, school like activities. But actually, if you're trying to make an impact in the job role that you've got, um, maybe as HR or as L&D or um, as supply chain or, you know, whoever we might be but your voice is not heard um, because, you know, you're, you're just that one that we take the mick out of because of, uh, you know, whatever characteristic. Um, you know, if your voice is not taken seriously um, and you're not able to contribute, that that's a really poor feeling. And I've had that before. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that's not a nice feeling to think that actually I don't really matter. I, I've, you know, have I, have I got a skill set that I can bring to the table? Or you kind of question it yourself. And that's, that's not a nice place to be. It's quite self-doubting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think banter needs to be open to all. Uh, you know, I think it has to be a level playing field. And and I think um, if you, even with even if you are purposefully not having banter with somebody because you think that it's not going to be perceived well by them, and it comes from a good place, that can then make that person feel excluded. And it it, it is very very difficult. I think it just it just needs to. I think it just needs to be light hearted fun for everybody. And then every, and, and inclusive, um, and it, it just find, it's finding that balance. Yeah. I think we go back a little bit to what I think Lee said about testing the water and kind of taking a lead from the individual. And if you're kind of trying that banter approach and you're getting met with, you know, they screw their face up and clearly are unhappy or somebody retreats into themselves, you know, goes very quiet, doesn't want to engage, it starts having a negative impact on them, then it's it's not banter anymore. It's not fun. Yeah, and and likewise, if you're that, I'm sorry. Go on, Lee. And likewise, if you're that person, if you find, I don't really want to use the word victim because that implies intent, but mm. if you're the person who's had the mick taken out of you and they, they just use that word you don't like or they just strike a nerve, you can deal with that. You can just, you know, I've, I've had that happen to me a long, long time ago. Uh, you know, we, we worked in a hotel and we all took the mick out of each other. That's just how we went on. Um, and someone just said that one word that just triggered something for me. Uh, and I just said, oh, I don't like that. I, I don't like that one. Let's not do that mm. one again. Done. Mm. Me and that person are still very good friends. It didn't have to, you know, go serious or formal, as long as you deal with it at the time. I was just going to say, I think often you can tell, you know, if you're in a group situation, and especially at work, it, it's a whole lot easier now. You might be on a Zoom call, you might be in an office, something like that. It's a bit of banter flying around. Someone goes quiet. It's really easy to just send them a quick instant message. Is everything all right? Notice you went quiet. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have to be, it doesn't have to be the person who said it and the person who reacted to it that solved the situation. Sometimes you can just go, I've noticed you've gone a bit quiet. Is everything all right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm all right. It's just that one got me a bit. It's like, yeah. I know it's not anything, per but just to be acknowledged that someone knows you've changed. Yeah. Just brings you back into the fold, doesn't it, sometimes? I think even sometimes when you kind of it obviously depend on what it is, but as um, as Claire said about you know sometimes it's not just the individuals in the banter, but maybe somebody who's overheard it, and you get a message from somebody that's heard a ban like banter and they sort of say, "Oh, I overheard this, and I wasn't okay with that." Mm -hmm. Just that dialogue starting. Yeah, and and there's nothing wrong with. Dialogue. Dialogue helps. It's more when it goes formal and I want to do this. And yeah. Even, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. And, and sometimes, in my experience, whilst I'm not saying that the comments, you know, that the comments have offended people, absolutely, but there might be something underlying and that person might really not like that, per other, that other person. And actually, it's not about what they've said. It's about several years of a real, real, real strange relationship. Um, and then actually picking up on that one comment isn't the appropriate action. It's it's dealing with it, it's taking a step back and what else is going on here. And I've had that I've had that a number of times before. Yeah, I, I've seen it as well. Weapon like weaponizing one situation, and then yeah. trying to get that used, and then trying to get 
multiple people behind it so that it creates a bit of a wave and it can really sort of disengage yeah. someone from an employee. Now, where we're kind of going, where we kind of got to is there's a fine line, but you need to you need to walk it. Yeah. For your own sanity more than anything, because there's a reason why comedians sell out arenas all over the world. There's a reason why people want to be laugh. There's a reason why people want to watch humor. There's a reason why you've probably at some point offended with banter every single member of your family with something you've said to them at some point. Mm -hmm. It's how we learn where the lines are. And research done by the University of Sussex found that banter reduces stress. Laughing together reduces stress. It creates balance. It creates camaraderie. It creates that ability to feel like you belong. And I think sometimes if you're not pushing lines with people, then do you really know them well enough um, is how it can sometimes feel. So if you are going to banter with someone, it doesn't have to be negative. It doesn't have to be deprecating. It can be just you look like you're on it today. You know, how are you getting on? Anything like that in terms of how you're getting on is just a question. It's not really banter. Terrible example. Lee didn't pick me up on it, so I'm going to just claim it before he does. But just lightly bring it in. And if they give it back and things like that, then you're in a safer space. This has been Let's Talk Out Child. This has been Is It Banter? I don't actually think we've worked out what an ideal line is, but I don't think there is one. There so isn't. Thank you very much to Claire, Anne-Marie and Lee. And we will catch you on the next one. Take care.